to introduce today's speaker. All right. Well, before I introduce Matt, I just wanted some people have been asking, in case you've been wondering, Hastings has not been evacuated yet, but they're on standby to go any minute. So most of the new evacuations this morning, including them. Hopefully that will be another year of close, but not quite. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Matt, today's speaker, Matt McManus, who was a graduate student in my lab during his time here at the MBC. Uh, Matt came to us having completed his undergrad work at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He finished there in 2005 and immediately moved to the PhD program here in the following fall. Uh, Matt was a member of my lab. For us, he led the charge in terms of genomics. I'll say more about that in a moment but focused a lot of his doctoral dissertation work on, as you'll learn, paramiscus and some of the emerging ecophysiological elements of the of California species of paramiscus. Matt, what do you say? There's several themes I want to hit, none of which is embarrassing, don't worry. Um, first of all, Matt has been highly successful, highly productive. He's now an assistant professor at the University of New Hampshire. He's been there since 2013. Um, he already holds two major NSF grants, or his co-PI and two major NSF grants. Uh, not surprisingly, while he was here at Berkeley, he was both an NSF pre-doctoral fellow, a chancellor's fellow, and had an NSF D-dig for his research. Um, so obviously off to a good start. He then went to an NSF postdoctoral fellowship with Mike Eisen here on campus, so again, pretty good friends. Um, and he's incredibly productive in terms of the number of papers, the number of projects he's involved in, uh, just really out there. The reason I mention that is any of you who know Matt or knew Matt in his graduate school days, aside from his science side and his science life and how much he gets done, Matt's kind of busy on other fronts. <laughs> well, those of you who are laughing know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> that, first of all, Matt came here having trained and been certified as an emergency room nurse. So throughout graduate school, he worked weekends the night shift as an emergency room nurse over at Stanford to make some extra money. So he's already going to grad school full time and doing that. Part of the reason he needed to make all that extra money is Matt has a family. He's a very dedicated father, quite a few kids. The oldest is now fledged and out of high school, believe it or not. Um, and so Matt also had a very busy, active family life that took up time, which I say this because I still don't understand how he got it all done, right? But he did, and obviously did well. Um, and as I mentioned, while Matt was here, he kind of was first wave of the genomics effort that now we're all deeply engaged in. And I was partly amused, so just a couple things to pull out of Matt's CV. Uh oh. No, no, no. It's a great CV. <laughs> first of all, ironically, one of his big NSF grants, he's co-PI with Becca Khaleesi, who's another person we know well around here. The title is The Neural Basis of Becoming a Parent. <laughs> ah, he's writing about what he knows. <laughs> but NSF liked it. The other thing I noticed where Matt lists his synopses of his active research programs, he's created every single possible word that ends in omics. We have ecophysiomics, neurogenomics, spongiomics, which apparently is sponges, the genomics of sponges, and it goes on from there. So if nothing else, he's good at creating new terms for the use of genomics in evolutionary biology. Um, I'll probably leave it there. Just the other thing I wanted to say before turning it over to Matt, aside from it's a real pleasure to see him back and have a chance to interact with him and see how well he's doing, Matt is around through tomorrow about midday and would like to chat with people if you're interested. Noah, you, you were one person in particular who was interested in maybe talking with. Yeah, yeah, you. <laughs> with the baguette. Yes. So um, you may touch base right after the talk. Also, Matt is headed to lunch right after the talk and would welcome anyone who might want to go along and then chat there as well. So feel free. Take advantage of him while he's here. With that, I hopefully have embarrassed you enough. Oh, I will say, too, the fun fact about Matt, and it's probably where he's headed right after this talk. Am I right? Uh, uh, maybe. Maybe? <laughs> Lucky House. Is it number seven? Anyway. I don't know. <laughs> Matt has to make a pilgrimage to Lucky House while he's here, and I assume that's where he's going. With that said, I'll turn the talk over and let Matt tell you about what he's been up to over the last few years, most likely focusing on since he's left the MDZ. Thanks, Matt. From all the bags.
Thanks, guys. Um, there, there are seats up front here in case you guys want to come up and. Um, I won't bite, and neither will people up here. So, yeah, it's it's really such a such a great pleasure to come back here and um, see all of the familiar faces and new faces and uh, all of that. And I, I kind of I spent the last four years telling myself that I, you know, I really didn't miss Berkeley and the museum all that much. And, um, I had kind of almost convinced myself of that, and then I came back here and I realized that like. Actually, this is the best place in the whole world. Um, and so for the people that um, you know, are grad students and postdocs and uh, well, everybody else, um, just realize how lucky you are to be here. Uh, it's really a great place. So, um, so today I'm going to tell you about um, yeah, what, what I've kind of been up to for the last um, you know, three or so years here. And um, the talk is informal, so if you have questions, please feel free to, um, to yell out or, or whatever. Um, I'm happy to try and answer. Um, so, so I want to start here. I, I want to say that, um, you know, really the, the kind of the process of adaptation um, is, you know, is, is it really surrounds us. And here I'm showing you uh, four of my favorite examples. So, of course, bacteria that live in hot springs and produce these beautiful colors. Um, buffalo that um, survive uh, such intense winter conditions. Whales, this kind of huge marine mammals living underwater and feeding on um, tiny kind of microorganisms. And lastly, these, um, these wonderful lizards that have evolved this light coat uh, you know, on these light backgrounds. And although I'm um, showing you these kind of more uh, abstract examples, really um, all you have to do is go outside and um, look around and you'll just be surrounded by really wonderful examples of adaptation. And so for the last, um, you know, at least a couple hundred years, we have um, proceeded to study adaptation by looking at the link between environment and phenotype. And when we saw a strong link, we said, oh, this is adaptation, right? And of course, one of the classic examples of adaptation to this day re remains the, the example of the Darwin's finches. And through much of this time, certainly the first 150 years or thereabouts, this notion of the genotype was largely absent from these studies. And it wasn't absent because we kind of forgot about it or didn't know it existed. It was absent because we didn't have the tools to kind of study it. And really all that changed about 15 years or so ago now with what I call the first wave of the genomics revolution, the model organism wave. And here we proceed by, se by sequencing these model organisms, <laughs> humans, fruit flies, mice, other, other things. And um, with these, with these kind of tools, we, we then had the ability to understand the complex genomic underpinnings of adaptation. Well, this, this kind of first wave of genomics was rapidly usurped or replaced by the second wave. And this is um, what I call the kind of sequence everything wave. And we're really in the midst of this wave now. And so these are, oh, a handful of the organisms that I have, I have had the opportunity to sequence from uh, from spiders to, to mites to, of course, tucos, and birds, and um, squishy marine things. Um, <coughs> and, and this has been a real um, boon for the evolutionary biology community because we had all these data to, to think about and to understand. And really, as a, as a kind of total aside, this, this second wave has turned into the third wave, the data deluge. And um, <laughs> I actually spend quite a lot of my time understanding and developing algorithms to to help us, um, you know, combat this deluge, which I will call a, a genomics crisis. You know, so right now we have, you know, 1.2 times <coughs> the 12 bases in our short read archive. For scale, this is about the number of fishes in all the oceans. This is a lot of data, and people are working very hard to try to understand it, um, because you know this isn't going anywhere. In fact, it's only getting worse. So, this. Uh, this kind of um, brief story of adaptation and big data, it, it really sets the stage for the story I'm going to tell you about today. And that is, of course, about deserts and about desert adaptation. And so um, maybe, maybe my first, first week or first couple of weeks of graduate school, I, um, I met with Eileen and um, we were trying to, you know, we were trying to develop a project, right? And she said, well, I was from New York, and she said, why don't you go to the desert? There's this weird, there's this weird mouse down here, the cactus mouse, and um, 
people have said that it was monogamous. And, well, nobody really knows. Why don't you go to the desert and, and kind of check it out? And so I did that. And um, I, was, I was so taken aback by this landscape. And, and for those of you that have spent time in the desert, I think you'll, you'll kind of know what, I, what I'm talking about here. It was really dramatic. I mean, the, you know, the, the first thing to notice is there's, you know, there's virtually no soil. This is you know, a hard, hard kind of rocky area here. It's, it's exceptionally dry. I mean, even the, you know, the kind of choya cactus looks like it's not doing very well. And there's you know, kind of dead things in the, in the foreground here. And it looks like this kind of barren landscape at first, at first blush. With, you know. But um, the amazing thing is that under every rock, under every kind of um, you know, piece of shade and felled cactus, there was something living there. And that kind of ability for animals to survive this incredibly hostile environment has, has motivated me really ever since. Now the, the kind of monogamy uh, mouse story, that project kind of you know, all fall, fell apart and, and never got done, but um, this kind of um, love of the desert has, has remained. And so the, the star of the story today is Paramiscus aramicus, and um, this, this cute little guy is um, really a great model for the study of dehydration tolerance. So it's, um, it's common in the southwest deserts. Um, it, uh, you know, it may live only you know, six months or maybe a little more or a little less, during which time it may never drink water. Right? So it lives in the desert and there are obviously periods of time, stretches of time where there's just no water. And um, on top of that, this, this animal, um, you know, it, do, it, it, so it doesn't take anything in, it also puts out very little. And so um, when you collect these organisms, when you collect normal mice, the experience is that they, they kind of pee all over the place and well, not these guys. They produce, you know, if anything at all, this kind of tarry, urine-like substance. Um, but, but despite living in these harsh conditions and kind of doing these crazy things, it, um, you know, it just, it's just a perfect little animal and it's happy to be there. And so just, just so everyone kind of um, uh, uh, understands, you know, there, there, of course, is a continuum of desert adaptation. And it, and it ranges, I think, on both ends from, you know, from one, the kind of heteromyid rodents down here. These are the classic animals of desert adaptation. So things like Dipotomies and the Chiodipus, all the heteromides, these are very, very specialized desert animals. So that's kind of on the dry side of the, of the continuum. On the wet side, well, there's lots of animals, of course, but, but, but the one I chose to put here is, is Matt Damon in The Martian as our <laughs> kind of representative, uh, our, our, uh, our, our specimen. And, um, you know, so, so where do we put um, the cactus mouse? You know, it's certainly someplace down here. It survives. But maybe, you know, maybe it isn't quite as adapted as, as, the, as these heteromides. So before I go any further, I just want to point out that kind of all of the experiments and details and whatnot that I'm going to tell you about today have all been done in this, uh, this custom desert chamber here that I built my, my first year at UNH. And this is, um, this is a really cool chamber. Um, it, as close as possible, replicates these desert conditions. So I can... Um, I, I have mice in here, um, cactus mice, and they experience the temperature and humidity exactly what they experience in the field. So it gets to, you know, 100 degrees or, or thereabouts, 10% humidity, cycles on a diurnal kind of schedule. So, so as close as possible in a lab environment, it replicates kind of the desert, the kind of natural, natural environment. And this has been really great to have captive animals, though I, I seriously miss being in the field. Um, it's really allowed me to develop some resources that are absolutely critical for understanding adaptation. And so the first thing that I'll tell you about is, of course, the, the genome. Um, and, um, and we've, we've uh, sequenced a, and assembled a really great genome here. We have um, 2.6 <coughs> gigabases and about 13,000 scaffolds with an N50. So this is not exactly the average size contig, but, um, but we can think about it kind of sort of like that. About 600,000 bases is so a pretty good <coughs> genome. And, and it's about 96% complete. So we find 96% of the things that we think should be there, actually there. So we've developed a, a nice contiguous genome. We have a transcriptome with lots of different tissues. And um, we're currently in the process of annotating. So we have right now about 19,000 gene models. And this is kind of uh, the hard work of assembling vertebrate genomes. This is kind of... Um, not nearly as important as all the physiological studies that we've been able to do. So, and again, these are, you know, these are kind of the, 
you know, the not very flashy but critically important work that you just have to do, right? And so we characterize, characterize patterns of electrolytes both you know, during and, and uh, before dehydration. Um, we, we've characterized weight and weight loss, how much animals actually lose in terms of weight during a kind of an acute dehydration event, how much water they actually drink, what their feces contain in terms of water, how concentrated their urine is, behavior, histology, hemodynamics. So we've kind of laid all of this kind of foundation for um, what over the next you know, three or four years is going to be really, kind of really exciting times here. And so, um, wow, um, there's supposed to be a one here. <laughs> there is. Anyways, it's grayed out, effectively grayed out, very effectively. Um, and what it's supposed to say, I don't know, can you guys see it? It says behavior. <laughs> I won't take offense. <laughs> <And, laughs> uh, I, I, I made behavior invisible not because I think it's not important. In fact, it's likely that behavior is, is one of the critical adaptations that animals possess when, when thinking about deserts, but because I kind of don't have any data to, to suggest one way or another kind of what those behaviors are and all, and all that. Um, so what I'll tell you about today are really the morphological adaptations and then physiological and genetic and we'll deal with kind of three and four in one piece. So first of all we'll talk about morphology and in particular I'll tell you just a little bit about the renal morphology and the respiratory morphology. These makes, kind of make perfect sense to study as um, when thinking about where animals lose water, rodents anyways, you think about um, the pee, right, that seems like a reasonable place, and then the respiratory tract which, which in mammals represents a huge source of water loss. So, so I'll just give you a little bit of a flashback to kind of high school biology here for those of you that haven't thought about kind of um, kidney stuff in a long time. So this is the, the kind of canonical mammalian kidney, right? This is what our kidney would look like and roughly speaking what a mouse kidney would look like. And the, the kind of functional unit of the kidney is the nephron, which is this structure here. And so, um, you know, in, in, a, in a, a small nutshell, what happens is that blood flows in and it's uh, filtered here in the glomerulus. Um, this is kind of the first pass filtering. Out goes the filtered blood, and in the kind of yellowish brownish tube goes the urine. All right, and then the whole rest of this structure here in the vascular kind of component is involved in getting the the kind of concentrations right. So this is kind of the the, the Bowman's capsule in the glomerulus. This is kind of the the quick and dirty filtering. All of this structure is kind of the stuff that actually gets it right. And in desert mammals, we like to think about two different things, right? We like to think about, um, well, well, what has been shown in things like diponymies are a couple of things. Well, we have this very elongate loop of Henle here. And, um, and this, this elongate loop here uh, is thought to very exquisitely allow for osmoregulation. So it's thought to be this kind of critical uh, adaptation that has allowed the heteromyids to adapt to desert conditions. And so when I started out with this work, I thought, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slice some kidneys. I'm going to see this Henley thing. It's going to be really cool, right? And, um, and I did that. And um, these are just some kind of gee whiz pictures here. But what I'm going to tell you is that the, the Aramicus kidney is such a boring kidney. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, I, I kind of compared it to um, the, the lab mouse, which is certainly not a desert adapted species. And they're basically equivalent. So there's no elongated loop of Henle and Aramicus. They don't have these kind of other things, um, um, more dense glomeruli, anything like that. It looks like a, a normal kidney. And when I when I first kind of saw this, I thought, oh, bummer. This this sucks. I'm like I didn't see the kind of critical cool thing. But then I, you know, of course I thought about it. I said, oh, geez, this is really cool. These guys don't have this thing that's supposed to be the critical adaptation. Yet they clearly survive. And so this was, this was, um, this was uh, ended up being a, a kind of really cool thing. So the next thing I'll tell you just very briefly about is the respiratory system, and in particular the upper respiratory tract. So for those of you that aren't, um, you know, spending your days looking at, at mammal skulls, um, <coughs> let me just give you a little orientation. So the incisors are here. You know, the eyeballs would be kind of there. The molars, and then the, the rest of the body would be kind of over here. And I want you to I want you to focus on this kind of middle section here, okay? And I want you to focus on well, I'm going to show you some pictures um, of of these bones called the turbinates. And turbinates are these um, these little specialized bones that are hypothesized to function as um, 
as this kind of cool countercurrent, or in this kind of cool countercurrent mechanism, whereby which um, exhaled air is drier than the inhaled air that it um, that, that was brought in. So the the air the the water is kind of condensed out. And and what we'd expect to see are very very complex turbinates, lots of little tiny bones here. And I'll show you some pictures here. So these are CT scans, micro CT scans of this kind of same region here. And the movie is going from backwards to front. And what I want you to see, and this is a remicus, what I want you to see are kind of all these tiny little bones here. All right, and so these are the turbinates, and there's a lot of, what I want you to see is a lot of structure here. There's lots of, lots of these kind of little things here. Now the next thing I'm going to show you is Paramiscus californicus. So the cactus mouse is sister species, a non-desert adapted animal. And it's kind of the same, the same area here, scanning front to back, same exactly, same thing. And, and what I want you to see here is kind of this big open space. There's still some structure, right? There's still some of these turbinates, but, but mostly what you see really is open space. So Aramicus has, and I'll just I'll fast forward here, Aramicus has a much more <coughs> complex turbinate system than does it, its sister species, a non-desert adapted animal. And these are, these are kind of the same, as much as, as much as one can do this exactly, they're the same kind of position on the animal, so I'm not kind of, uh, you know, there's no funny business here with looking at different sections. And um, the hypothesis is, is that this more complex turbinate system results in drier exhaled air, and of course then water retention, all right? So we're, we're kind of currently in the process of following this up, so seeing in fact whether, at least in this guy, the air is drier on the way out, but, um, but it, it's been shown in other systems, and it seems like a pretty good bet that there, there are some unique adaptations here in, again, in the upper respiratory tract. Okay, so, um, so let's, let's move on to the next section here, the physiology and genetics section. <coughs> All right, so the question is, what happens in humans during dehydration? All right. And so again, we have um, poor old Matt Damon here in his astronaut outfit, um, and you know, kind of what would happen if he were um, left to his own devices and um, and there in the desert. And well, so what would happen is he would um, he would lose weight and he would dehydrate, right? Um, his electrolytes would become more and more and more abnormal. He'd have electrolyte imbalance, and in the end, what kills a lot of people during dehydration. Is, uh, is a cardiac arrhythmia. So at some point your electrolytes become so out of whack that your heart can't function in its normal fashion and it does something that doesn't uh, or isn't kind of conducive uh, to life and then you die. Um, if, if, you know, if Matt Damon is lucky enough to, you know, at kind of the very last minute uh, get, a, get a drink or something, he very likely would be left with a lifelong um, renal condition. All right, so what happens during dehydration is, of course, your, your organs don't get enough blood, and um, the kidney, very much so, is like the canary in the coal mine. It's one of the first things to die. And so if he were to survive this kind of dehydration event, he would do so, but maybe, maybe you know, on dialysis or, or with poorly functioning kidneys. So what happens in the mouse? All right, well, um, I'll show you some data to, to support this in a, uh, in a little bit here, but. But in fact, the, the, the mouse um, does lose quite a lot of weight. Um, there is uh, a pretty substantial electrolyte imbalance. But unlike in the human, um, survival is, you know, he's, he's a, a happy mouse. He certainly doesn't die. And, and he does not appear to have any renal impairment that's you know, characteristic of the human condition. So um, to, to kind of talk about this stuff, I'm going to lead you through a, a series of experiments here. And so eventually we're going to kind of do, you know, do kind of all of these experiments here where we compare mice that have been housed in cool conditions with and without water, with it, you know, and then adding a humidity treatment. What I'm going to tell you about today is um, mice that have been housed in the hot desert-like environment without water, okay? And we're going to compare that to mice that have been in that same environment. Um, everything else is the same. They've just been able to drink water, all right? So they've had access to water. And we're gonna we're gonna um, hopefully um, think about some of the differences we see in terms of um, mostly gene expression. So just a little bit about the experimental <coughs> details here. 
Um, we have a wet group and a dry group. We have 18 and 19 samples. So this is as um, genomics experiments go, as RNA-seq experiments go. This is a, a very highly replicated experiment. Um, during the experiment, we can monitor lots of different things, including weight and weight loss, water intake, electrolytes, um, other properties related to hemodynamics and things like that. We measure lots of things. And of course, this is the, the benefit of having these animals in the lab. You can, you can think about all these things. And then we sequenced each of these individuals between 5 and 15 million reads. We quasi-mapped using salmon. And then we, we used HR and, and, um, and looked at uh, um, correlation networks in the end. So the first thing I'm going to do is tell you kind of very generally the results of what, what we found here. And then, um, it, it, and then towards the tail end, we'll, um, we'll kind of narrow it down just a little bit. So, um, so what we found uh, was about 400 differentially expressed genes. And it's roughly um, equally divided between things that were upregulated and downregulated. So there, and I think there are maybe 220 here and 180 or so down there, but roughly speaking, equally so. That's, of course, a plot. What are all those red dots? First thing that kind of the standard person would do is they would look at the gene ontology categories that, um, you know, that are that are in the genes that are differentially expressed both ways, right? And so we, when we look at things that are highly expressed in the dehydrated mice, all right, in the kidneys of the dehydrated mice, well, you know, we see these kind of um, very general geontology terms. And I'm, I'm kind of the first one to say that geontology terms can be um, a, a big letdown. And this kind of first plot here, you, you should all be feeling this letdown. Right? He, he came here to tell me about, like, yeah, I don't even know what. Um, but the, the cool thing is you can actually look at um, what, What's enriched in these groups here? So, which genes or which types of genes, you know, do we see way more of than we would expect given kind of the patterns of genes? And and this is what this plot is. And so, so you see percent enrichment. Well, 80% enrichment of you know leukemia B420 monooxygenase. Well, this doesn't mean anything to anybody except for you know maybe a biochemist. But but I want you to I want you to kind of I'm going to tell you just a couple of things about this. The first thing is. Is, is I want you to notice that several of these terms end in monooxygenase, okay, three of them here. So, so if there are biochemists in the room, or if you remember back to your biochemistry days, you'll remember that one of the things that monooxygenases do is they kick out a water molecule at the end of, the end of, of their, their job, okay? So, so what we're seeing here, these genes that are, that are um, enriched in dehydrated animals, is the signal of metabolic water production, all right? So all of these monooxygenase genes, they're all producing a water molecule at the very end, all right? The other thing I want you to notice here are these two terms here, arachidonic acid. Okay, so arachidonic acid is, uh, is a polyunsaturated fatty acid, and it is metabolized in the kidney by a cytochrome P450 gene, which I think a lot of us know as this kind of um, toxin gene, right? It, gets it helps metabolize toxins. Well, cytochrome P450 in the kidney does something else. It metabolizes arachidonic acid, and it produces a really potent vasoconstrictor. All right? And what happens in kidneys when they're dehydrated is the perfusion pressure falls. All right? Basically, you're not getting enough blood flow to the kidneys, and then they die. Well, it looks like, and I have, I have not really great evidence, but we're, we're kind of amassing evidence to suggest that this arachidonic acid metabolism is keeping the renal perfusion pressure up, thereby protecting the kidneys, preventing them from dying, basically. All right, so what do we see in the kind of opposite condition? So what are the things that are lowly expressed in dehydration? Well, again, you have this kind of um, uninformative graph here, but the, the kind of enrichment terms, well, this is, this is also pretty cool. And, and what I want you here to notice is that all of them, Every single one of them that are significantly enriched have to do with transport. Okay, so there is an uh, inorganic exchangers, uh, sodium dependent transmembrane transporters. Anyways, they all end in transport. These are all genes that are responsible for shuffling things across membranes. And it turns out that, um, so okay, the opposite side to the coin is high in hydration, right? So in a hydrated mouse, um, the kidney, like you'd expect, is doing lots of shuffling of ions and, and things like that. We don't see any of this stuff in the dehydrated mouse, right? They're just not, there's no water to facilitate that transport. All right. 
So, so the next thing in this kind of very general um, um, kind of look at the expression studies I did were to, were to identify co-expression modules. All right. So basically, these are you know this is a, a big dendrogram. Each of these is a, is the gene, and these are the, the goal of this analysis is to identify modules of genes that behave similar. They're all, they're all kind of being expressed in the same way, kind of doing the same thing. And this is, this is of course, not a, not a very informative graph because there are no kind of genes on there. But the, the cool thing is, is I can look at each one of these modules in, independently in the context of the physiology. So, so on, the, on the kind of, um, on the side here are all the different modules. And there are, I don't know, 10 or 11 of them there. And each of the modules has uh, a name, okay, a general description of the function. And so you think you see things like stress, and ion transport, nephron development, and so on and so forth. All right. On the bottom you see the actual physiology that it's that we're that we're thinking about. So how much did the mouse weigh before the experiment? How much did it lose? How much water did it drink? Sodium and then kind of five electrolytes here. The colors, all right, so red means positively associated with the given uh, phenotype or physiologic prop, uh, kind of uh, measurement, and blue is negatively associated. So what we can see is, well, stress, all right, lots of kind of the darker, the kind of tighter the association. Lots of um, action here in our stress module, all right. In fact, I think the, the strongest correlation, or maybe the, maybe the strongest <coughs> correlation you see is right here between stress and sodium. The numbers here, I know you can't see the numbers, I apologize for that. It's the strength of the correlation and the p-value, all right? And so you see, I don't know what this one is. I think, the, I think it's 0 0.8 and maybe, um, well, a very small p-value anyways, all right? So this was really cool to start thinking about um, functions versus phenotypes or physiology, all right? So again, we see stress very active. We see, obviously, the nephron being very active where there are some really strong correlations, <laughs> particularly between, um, you know, genes that are involved in nephron function and, and electrolytes. All right. So let's zoom in just a little bit here. Those, those are kind of the general results, but I think zooming in is, is really cool. And we'll kind of focus in on, you know, on the differences here, here between, the, between, the, between Matt Damon and the mouse. Uh, and the first thing I'll show you is just the kind of context. Well, dehydration-related weight loss and electrolyte arrangement. Turns out these guys lose a heck of a lot of weight when you dehydrate them. So if the wet mouse weighs, um, this is 25 or 26 grams, over the course of three or four days, they drop by sometimes as much as 35% of their body weight. And I was freaked out when I first saw this. I thought, you know, I, 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 you know, I could weigh all these mice and weigh these mice here. And I thought, oh my gosh, these, you know, the, the mouse is about dead. You know, it's lost 35% of its body weight. And then I, you know, I kind of take, took a step back and looked. I had, well, the mouse is like it's hopping around, it's you know trying to mate, it's kind of doing all the all the you know kind of mouse mouse like behaviors. So so this this mouse or these mice have lost a tremendous amount of body weight over the course of this acute dehydration challenge, but functionally, at least at least you know kind of anecdotally, they're they're pretty fine. They're acting like normal mice, and and um, this is in stark contrast to what would happen to a human. Right? So what happens when humans lose 35% of their body weight? Like they're either <laughs> dead or they're in the ICU and very, very sick or you know, something else. So they're, they're not happy. Um, and then the next thing I'll show you is, is um, electrolyte uh, imbalance. So, um, so this is sodium, which is um, the marker that if we were to look at you and dehydration, we would look at. Um, we see a very, very nice correlation, as you'd expect, between um, percent loss body weight and serum sodium. So basically, these mice, they both lose a lot of weight and their electrolytes show it. All right. So, so the question is, how do they avoid arrhythmia? All right. Because at some point, you'd expect their electrolytes to become so out of whack. And in fact, at the, at the, the kind of measures that we see in our mice, humans, you know, would be in very, very bad shape. All right. How do they do it? And so, so another, another little flashback um, to, to high school uh, biology is, is just a, a little bit about the heart here. And so what happens in the heart is that the, is, is that the, the, the heart receives a, uh, an electrical signal from the SA node. It's conducted, this is in the atria. 
it's conducted down to the AV node, which then sends it to the ventricle, and you have this nice coordinated um, contraction, all right? And, and, and these electrical signals, of course, are directly dependent on membrane <coughs> action potentials, depolarization, stuff like that, that are all channel-based, okay? So they all have to do with these channels that um, open and close, allow ions um, in or out, and, um, you know, and, and so the question is how do they function? Particularly this guy, this, this, the kind of initial depolarization phase here is um, the product of, or is controlled by a sodium channel. So, so how does it work when sodium is so much higher than, uh, than normal? It turns out because of humans and, and lab mice and, and all these others, we have great <coughs> ideas about linking function to actual sequence data. And I, I won't show you the results here, simply, um, well, they're a little bit preliminary, and also I, I already run a little bit long here, and that is that we have some, some amino acid differences right along the kind of transmembrane ion channel that look like they're, you know, they, they, they may be very interesting in terms of conferring a mouse's channel's ability to function despite severe electrolyte abnormality. So how do they avoid, avoid arrhythmia? Well, stay tuned, but it looks like, again, there's, there's some cool kind of channel, channel stuff happening here. So the next question is, how is renal failure prevented? So, um, so this is kind of the very classic um, um, kind of autoregulation <coughs> paradigm that happens in humans and lots of other things, where, where, where there's this large zone um, where it kind of doesn't matter what your blood pressure is. Your kidneys are okay. And it's because the kidney possesses these really intricate autoregulatory um, kind of abilities. But, um, but you know, you, what happens is as the arterial pressure f falls, due to dehydration or blood loss or, or whatever, very rapidly so, the renal blood flow and uh, measure of uh, glomerular, fil glomerular filtration falls, and then you end up with problems, you end up with renal failure. So, so in humans, you know, kind of this happens. In mice, you know, it, it, it may happen, but it doesn't happen under the kind of normal physiological conditions that, that we've observed. So, so, you know, this kind of dotted line is extended way out towards the, um, uh, towards towards the left. So how does this happen? All right. Well, we think we have we have just a little bit of evidence and are kind of amassing um, more as we speak that it's that it's really this arachidonic acid metabolism thing that I touched on just a couple of minutes ago. So what happens is arachidonic acid is metabolized um, into this uh, 20 HETE compound, which is again this kind of um, vasoconstrictor by one of our cytochrome P450 genes here. And when you look at the the, uh, the kind of keg pathway, so the pathway of genes that are responsible for metabolizing these things, well basically all of these genes are differentially expressed, okay? So the genes are in these kind of little uh, jelly beans and red, red means significantly differentially expressed in the, in the dehydrated. And they're all differentially expressed, <coughs> all right? So we see lots of signal here that this, this uh, arachidonic acid pathway is really important to these guys. And the cool thing is, um, you know, we looked in, well, there's just a couple of studies that have, that have kind of done these things before. Um, and um, the, these, these cytochrome P450 genes, they really don't show up in other, in other studies. Um, and so this looks, looks to be something that, you know, we haven't studied all of the, you know, many of the desert organisms, but it looks like this kind of, um, this mechanism may be something that's, that's um, relatively unique here, uh, used in the context of dehydration. And, and lastly, just the the kind of box plot of the differences. So, so the, the kind of, the, the neat thing is that we don't see really signs of dysregulation in severe dehydration. So of course what happened in this human uh, kind of paradigm in the zone of autoregulation is genes would be turned on or turned off as the case may be um, in an effort to preserve renal blood flow. But you'd get to a tipping point at some point, right, where the, the cells would not be receiving enough oxygen, they would just stop doing the normal thing and they would die, right? And what you would see um, is, you know, is a fall off of some of these critically important vasoconstrictor or, or other genes here. And so instead of there being kind of straight lines and, and nice tight correlations, you'd, you'd see at very high levels of sodium or very high levels of dehydration, you'd see fall here. And with our guys, you know, we basically can, can push the dehydration as much as, you know, to a plateau, and you never see a sign of dysregulation. So they're, they're kind of, these, these compensatory mechanisms 
um, they seem to they seem to be uh, unwavering in their function. <clears throat> so so the elephant in the room, of course, is this, right? So I I told you at the beginning of the talk, right, that we do this in this you know these experiments, this cool desert chamber, and we're trying to replicate the, the desert as much as possible in New Hampshire. But you know, but as as we know, um, even even in these kind of tightly controlled experiments, well. It's, it's just not the same, right? There are lots of things. Um, diet, you, know, you, you name it. The, this room knows all, all the reasons why lab animals just don't equal wild animals. And so, so the question is, you know, when, when looking at these kind of critical genes here, cytochrome P450 and angiotensinogen, which is one of the um, key autoregulatory genes, what would happen here? You know, so what, what would these wild animals look like? All right, so Lots of high expression in the, in the experimental dehydration treatment, much much higher than in the wet individuals. So what would happen? What would happen here to these wild animals? And I, of course, I just so happen to have um, uh, a set of animals here, and these these are animals that were collected in the springtime, in uh, just outside of Palm Springs. So anybody take a take a venture a guess here? Where do these wild animals fall out? Do they look like dehydrated animals, or do they look like wet animals? In between. Mm -hmm. wet. In between wet, yeah. So, so there's the two. All right, there's the two, and of course there are you know fifteen thousand others. But springtime animals, so you know spring in the desert's a pretty pretty amazing time to be there, and it's not very hot. It maybe just a little bit more moist. These animals, boy, they look like wet animals, right? This guy, it's you know maybe slightly intermediate, but but you know this this is this looks like a wet animal. And, and there are, of course, some genes that, um, you know, where, where the yellow would be up here with the, with the dry. There are some genes that resemble, but most of them, well, most of these wild springtime animals look like wet animals. And so the question is, for me, well, what does it look like in August? You know, what, what would the animals, what would expression have looked like this August when it was so dry? And I don't know the answer to that question, but it's it's one of the one of the things we hope to do over the next couple of years to really get back to the field because, um, you know, like like of course all of you recognize the the lab animals are great and they're a great proxy and allow us to do these kind of physiologic experiments. But most of us in the room we're interested in what happens in the wild, right? We want to know about you know about quote unquote reality, and um, and so so getting back to the field here is going to be really important. All right, so what have I told you about today? Um, you know, we've done a, um, a lot of this kind of um, not so flashy physiology work, looked at water, you know, feces, electrolytes, some um, micro CT scanning, renal histology looks boring. Um, we've done some work with the channels, though we're doing lots more of that. And the arachnoic acid cytochrome P450 story looks, looks pretty compelling so far. And, and um, you know, of course, each of these finding ha findings has kind of a rabbit hole to go down. And um, so for future work, we've got lots of things to do. But of course, we looked at kidneys, but there are lots of other tissues that we should look at. And not just expression, of course, but, but other things. There's all the kind of real cardiac electrophysiology that we need to do, renal blood flow. Like I say, we've collected some of that using um, non-invasive ultrasound, but there's some kind of little issues with that. The cool thing is that a lot of these genes are, are very, very easily drugged. So there are, some, there are drugs that already exist that will um, inhibit the effects of cytochrome P450, for instance, and, and then lots of the channels. So, so there'll be some cool kind of pharmacologic manipulations. Um, it looks like CRISPR is probably within our reach, um, at least if not now, then sometime in the near future. And obviously the wild animals, both looking at expression and also uh, um, issues of allelic variation. Um, so I just acknowledge some funding sources here. Um, I um, have a, a great startup. Um, it's allowed me to do some really cool things for UNH. Like uh, Eileen said, I have two active NSF awards that support uh, much of the lab. Uh, I have a, a great kind of small group of students that um, you know mostly put up with me and um, and all that. And um, with that, I'll take some questions. And like Eileen said, uh, I'll be around. So happy to talk to people afterwards. Uh, thanks. There must be a dietary component to this dehydration test. Absolutely. And if, are the animals actually going to be, is there, is dehydration going to be controlled by the weather or is it going to be controlled by food availability if they're getting most of the moisture from food and then how do you deal with that in the environment? Yeah, you really can't deal with that in the, in the chamber. That's one of those environmental variables that we just can't, can't get, a, get a good handle on. You know, they, 
And, and actually, we don't have a real good handle on what exactly they're eating and what, you know. So we know they eat seeds and stuff like that, obviously, but, but how much, you know, how, how many beetles and ants and things like that are, are they eating? I, um, that would obviously be a great source of water were they to be eating them, you know, insects. Um, from work in the fields, I don't know, I, this, you know, Jim's, of course, you know, done this for a few more years than I have. I actually see a lot of, uh, you know, insects and things in their guts when I, when I open them up. So I don't know how much, how much that actually contributes. But yeah, the, the diet, um, you know, you would expect, expect animals to bias their diet in one way or another um, to enhance metabolic water production. That stuff we kind of can't really, can't really do in the lab right now. So, bummer. Jim, Paul. I was just curious about um, what the sister species was of, of this of this guy, and um, what plans do you have for um, sampling yeah. relatives of these desert mice that are not in the desert, and both in the lab and in the field? Yeah. So, so it's Premiscus californicus, so a, a kind of um, a mouse we have around here, and and uh, lots of other places in California. Um, they are not <coughs> desert adapted. You will find them in fairly xeric conditions, um, and um, there are a couple of other desert adapted paramiscus as well. So there's um, Crinitis, which is, um, you know, a good desert species as well. Um, one of the one of the things that I really you know would love to do is get back to the field and do a comparative study. Bring those guys into the lab, I think, is a little bit tricky for, you know, kind of I have cook reasons mostly, and that um, you know they don't. Even though I would find them together in the field in some places, they won't let me co-house them. I only have one of these desert chambers, and so it becomes a little te a little. A little tricky to do it in the lab, but yeah, that comparative study ultimately I think is is um, is going to be really awesome. And of course, not just rodents too. There are, there are um, a whole host of other taxa living in the desert that probably are <clears throat> tackling this problem in, in different ways. So yeah, I I, I really I recognize <coughs> it and would love to do it. Yeah, I was going to ask a similar kind of question because there are other species of paramiscus that are out there that are unrelated. <coughs> different yeah. clades within the genus, um, and they're all facing the same problems. Yeah. <coughs> but I was going to just make a comment that uh, Aramicus, uh, in the hottest and driest areas of our deserts, which is the Death Valley region, yeah. it is actually uh, distributed near water sources. Okay? And so it is, if you want to go to a spring or a riparian community, uh, or something like that, that's where you'll find a remicus. If you get away from that 100 meters, yeah. that's where you find in the drier zones a crinitis. crinitis. And so it would re be really interesting to look at crinitis. Yeah. That to me is the more desert adapted of the paramus. Yeah. 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 And I guess the other, to, to follow up that, you know, the, um, thinking about different ways in which animals adapt, it, you know, if you look at the, the Dipotomies literature, so the heteromyids, yeah, well, well, of which there is a fairly substantial kind of, um, you know, literature, they all talk about the aquaporin genes as being the, the, the kind of critical genes. And, um, you know, of course I look for the aquaporins and they're like the most boring genes in there. They're not, you know, they're not differentially expressed any, any which way. And so right there, you know, aquaporins and the heteromyids, at least in the few that we studied, you know, something else in, in my mind. So I think there's probably lots of ways to, to get at this, this issue. Doing all those studies would be super cool. Yeah. Dave. It seems like there's a lot of work to keep going in these environments. What's the cost? And is the cost a lifespan? Is, that, is, is there a, a significant lifespan deficit relative to close volumes? That's a hard question to answer. Um, you know, I think. My experience in the in the in the wild um, with some radio telemetry and whatnot is that these animals um, die of predation like crazy. So I think most of the time, you know, they're not living their kind of whole natural lifespan because they're being eaten by snakes and hawks and owls and whatever else is. So it's it's hard to hard to know. You know, because I think they're so predated upon what their actual lifespan would be without those things. I, I don't know. I would expect there would be. I mean, this, these are tough conditions, and um, animals must pay the price to, to survive. But I don't know what that is. We're just going to actually 
I wonder if they really are tough conditions. They're tough to us, and so we, we bias ourselves well. by looking at it in that perspective. But I don't think for most of these little guys, you know, uh, they're doing, they, you know, well, they've been playing this game for a long, 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 long time. Yeah. And well, they've got both behavioral and all these physiological and morphological adaptations to deal with it. And they all deal with it in very, very different yeah. ways. Yeah, well, that's a good point. We, we say tough because it's tough for yeah, us. Exactly. But, um, yeah, point taken. It may not be that, that tough for these guys. There are plenty of rodents in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. There's no the shortage. Of rodents in yeah. the world. And density. Yeah. Yeah. And a truly tough environment. You yeah. would not expect to see that. So. You're yeah. Right. Question over here. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about the how to, the interpretation of the gene expression results and wondering um, how plastic structures within nephrons are, like within an individual, and whether if you see a change in gene expression, is that due to changes in the relative contributions of different structures to sort of the global kidney yeah. expression, or is it due to actual changes in expression in homologous structures? Right. Within nephrons, you see the decision. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Chris and I were talking about this yesterday. You know how how dynamic are, is the nephron? Right. That my, I don't, I don't actually. I, this is opinion. But my sense is that these structures are not plastic. That the nephron is, you know, the loop of Henle is as long as it's going to be, and it's not elongating during acute dehydration or something like that. But I, I, I don't know that. Anyone's kind of looked at that in a kind of dynamic context before, so so I could be I could be completely wrong, but that, that's my sense. That there's you have evolved a certain length and a certain density, and and that's what you're stuck with. Do you know if the evolutionary constraint has changed in the genes that you found to be enriched um, in your ontologies in this Paramiscus species relative to? Yeah, I don't know anything about that, but that's that's one of the things that we're really really anxious to, to kind of think about more. Yeah, the constraint issue. You you would expect to see some some cool stuff there, but I don't know anything about that yet. Well, it just might help dissect the structural from regulatory. Yeah. Sort of changes. Yeah. They play into. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we 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 will love to do that work for sure. Yeah. Next time I come here. <laughs> So um, you mentioned that the that Perumicus lived about a year um, or so. I think um, I think less than that, but. I, yeah. So where do you get the ones that you put into the chamber, and what happened to them in the short time that you have mm -hmm. them? So the so there's a there's a stock center. Oh. Um, okay. Which is which is an amazing amazing Perumicus resource. Um, so <coughs> so these are animals that were um, wild caught, you know, several years ago, many years ago. And um, and um, so I can purchase animals, and you know the animals. So I, when I had the, the chamber, I bought a bunch of animals, and now they're kind of freely reproducing, self-sustaining, and all that. Um, and in the lab, I mean, I have some really old mice. I mean, I, I have some mice in the lab that live. Oh, I don't know. I've had. I think I might even have like a two-year-old mouse at this point. There, there's some. Oh. Um, if you you know if you uh, wow, feed and water and uh, don't let snakes eat them and things you know actually live a, a bit longer. I just wanted to make a comment. You you compared uh, the kidney of, of Paramiscus aramicus to mus, which you um, suggested was a mesic species. <laughs> the native range of, of Mus domesticus is are the deserts of the Middle East, and they can survive without free water. So yeah. I, I, I wonder how it would look in comparison to something like Braddus. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do it. I, I know there must be images out there uh, yeah, I'm sure there to are. look at. All right, if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank Matt again. And he's around to talk this afternoon and tomorrow.